Good morning. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about myths of sinus surgery. I have nothing to disclose. The objectives of today's talk are to identify the types of surgical options available for patients with chronic inflammatory sinus disease. We're going to summarize the postoperative recovery and describe expected surgical outcomes. We'll first begin by defining chronic rhinosinusitis. Rhinosinusitis is defined as symptomatic inflammation of the sinus and nasal cavity. You have to have two of the following four symptoms, facial pressure, nasal obstruction, nasal discharge, and decreased smell. In order for it to quantify as chronic, it needs to be uh, present for greater than three months. So this is a CAT scan with a patient with chronic sinusitis with polyps, greater than three months of duration. In terms of morbidity, chronic rhinosinusitis affects approximately one out of every 10 U.S. adults. It accounts for about five out of every 100 medical office visits, and approximately 500 or greater than 500 sinonasal surgeries are performed annually in the United States. Uh, patients will admit that prior to undergoing sinus surgery, about 70% of them do their own research. Uh, the things that they're most interested in looking into includes risks and benefits of surgery and recovery-related issues. Younger patients tend to look to the internet for their information, and older patients more often rely on you, the primary health care provider. And that's why I decided to talk about this today. Um, so there's six myths that we're going to undergo or talk about, and the first myth is that Chronic sinusitis can only be treated with um, surgical options. Patients always have the option of proceeding with medical therapy as long as they don't have a pending uh, complication or concern for a tumor. I have on my original slides a list of the medications that are commonly prescribed. There's three that are currently approved by the FDA, and that's topical nasal steroids, saline irrigations, and biologic modifier therapy. Before moving on to surgery, we often talk about maximizing medical therapy or adequate medical therapy. So patients need to fail this prior to considering the surgical option. And that is defined as greater than or three to four weeks of systemic antibiotics, one to two weeks of systemic steroids, and topical nasal steroid sprays. The myth number two is that there's only one type of sinus surgery. Okay, and before we talk about the types of sinus surgery, let's kind of review the anatomy. The nose consists of the nasal septum and three turbinates on each side. The septum divides the nose into a right and left side. The turbinates are structures with tissue that humidifies air, warms air, and filters air. The sinuses are paired cavities that drain into the nose, and there's four on each side. That's the frontal, the ethmoid, the maxillary, and the sphenoid sinuses. So when we talk about sinus surgery, there's about 12 different procedures that we can perform. Uh, so when we look at the different surgeries, you have septoplasty, which is fixing the nasal septum, which is deviated in a large percentage of the population. We can reduce the turbinates, and then we have the sinus surgeries. And this consists of balloon dilation or traditional endoscopic sinus surgery. External approaches are rarely done and are mentioned only for historical purposes. Patients often come in and want to know if there's going to be incisions on their face, and the answer to that is no. So the goals of sinus surgery is first to ventilate the sinus. Second is to remove disease, which is usually polyp tissue, uh, infection, or fungal debris. And the third goal is to provide access for topical medical therapy. So here we have a picture of a coronal CT scan of a patient with a bacterial infection that's demonstrated by the gray tissue on the left side of the patient, that is your right side, that black is represented by air, and we see a year later after their sinus surgery, the sinus is well ventilated. A corollary to this is that all sinus surgery is invasive, and that's not true. There's multiple procedures that can be done with limited anesthesia and limited recovery in the clinic setting. The first is turbinate procedures, where we reduce the size of the turbinates. We can also do balloon sinuplasty, which is demonstrated here. The balloon is inserted into the maxillary sinus, and the sinus is then irrigated. We can also do limited sinus surgery and polyp removal. This is referred to as a microdebrider. This is an instrument that cuts and sucks tissue, much like a liposuction device. 
Patients will often refer to this as a roto-rooter. Finally, we can place drug-eluting stents. These release steroids into the sinus over a period of one to three months. Sometimes they dissolve and sometimes they have to be removed. This is especially helpful in patients with polyps, and we see here one of those stents in the left frontal sinus. The third myth is that my eyes will be black and blue, and this is not true. This is a complication of surgery. There's minor and major complications associated with sinus surgery, and patients need to understand this. Major complications include cerebral spinal fluid leaks and other or, or, uh, intracranial complications, orbital complications, and life-threatening hemorrhage. In a large study of about 80,000 patients, the risk of a major complication was about one-third of a percent. When we look at revision surgery rates, it doesn't increase that much more, and it's about half a percent. But when you consider that there's greater than 500,000 surgeries performed annually in the United States, that means there's about 1,800 major complications per year. So this is not insignificant, even though it's rare. And patients are usually coming in, and they're concerned about having revision surgery. But again, it's an important point that that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to more likely to have a complication. This was a study where patients were asked about their uh, post-operative expectations prior to undergoing surgery. And what patients generally reported is that they underestimated the amount of bleeding after surgery. Even when it wasn't life-threatening, patients get a little bit of bleeding in the first few days. But what was most important about this study was that patients incorrectly believed, and that was about 50% of patients, that there was either no risk or only minor risk associated with sinus surgery. So preoperative counseling is very important when it comes to um, the uh, complications. The fourth myth is that my nose will be packed and taking out the packing is painful. There's generally three concerns when it comes to nasal packing. Can I breathe? Does the packing hurt? And uh, will it hurt when it's taken out? In my experience, patients overestimate all three of these. So let's look at packing a little bit. Packing can be absorbable or non-absorbable. It can be permanent, I mean, it can be in the nose or in the sinuses. This is nasal stents that's placed in the nose after a septoplasty. And they're rigid, but they have holes in there so people can breathe through them. Sinus packing is a little different. Sinus packing is soft. In this case, this is placed in the right ethmoid cavity, and this is a dissolvable packing. So this is a patient with permanent packing or non-absorbable that has to be removed. But again, it's soft. In both cases, the patient can easily breathe through their nose. And this is that final type of packing, which are the absorbable stents, or in this case, a non-absorbable drug-eluting stent. This releases steroid over time and decreases patient's exposure to systemic steroids. This was a nice study looking at the morbidity of packing. Specifically, they looked at pain and blockage with packing. And they were graded on a scale of 0 to 10. And in terms of pain, patients averaged a 2 to a 4. In terms of blockage, patients averaged a 3 to a 4. Patients that had absorbable packing tended to do slightly better than patients with non-absorbable packing. The fifth myth is it'll take a long time to recover. In general, patients require about 1 to 2 weeks to recover from surgery. We modify their activity for up to 3 weeks. But what they care most about is pain associated with the surgery. And we can correlate pain with the total narcotic use. In this study, the average patient consumed about eight pills after surgery, all with, usually within the first three or four days. Most patients are not taking pain medications by day number three. And in this specific study, there was no association with stent or placement of packing and higher narcotic use. These are the two graphs from the study. On the left, we see narcotic use over time, and on the right, we see total pain scores over time. And what's important is that they correlate. Pain is greatest on postoperative day number one, and it quickly tails off by day number three or four. This was an interesting study about uh, looking at 179 different surgeries. And what they did is they rated the postoperative pain on day number one. And what we see is that paranasal sinus surgery was near the bottom at 148. Septoplasty was around 122. And neither of these was close to what a tonsillectomy causes. But tonsillectomy patients can rest assured that they're not having an open reduction 
of a calcaneal fracture, which took home the award as the most painful procedure in this study. Not all patients recover to the same extent or have the same amount of pain. Risk factors for more pain in the postoperative period include more complex sinus surgery. Undergoing septoplasty with sinus surgery is more painful than either procedure alone. Active smokers and patients with a primary headache disorder like migraines tend to have a harder recovery. And in multiple studies, packing has mixed results. What's most important is that patients undergoing revision sinus surgery do not have a greater uh, level of postoperative pain. In fact, in my experience, patients that are undergoing revision surgery have less pain. So for those patients who probably had a previous a bad experience with sinus surgery, it's important that you encourage them to get an opinion if they feel like it didn't work. In terms of outcomes, there's four things we look at to measure uh, whether sinus surgery works. First is do we meet patient expectations? Second, we can look at patient reported outcome measures. Uh, third, we can look at objective data like endoscopic scores or CT scores. And finally, we can look at revision surgery rates. So in terms of meeting postoperative expectations, this was a study from 2019 in which Smith reported that only 60% of patients found that their postoperative improvement in symptoms matched their preoperative expectations. However, 88% would recommend surgery to a family or friend and patient-reported outcome me measures were high at greater than 75% improvement. So this is a relatively low number in terms of meeting patient expectations, but what's most important about this is that patients have realistic expectations going into surgery. In that same study we looked at before where patients were asked about their expectations, about 30% incorrectly believed that they would never have a sinus infection again. So it's important in the preoperative counseling session to let patients know that we're modifying the disease, we're improving symptoms, but we're not curing the disease. This is the most common patient-reported outcome measure, and it's ironically called the SNOT-22. This is not referring to SNOT in the nose, but it stands for the sinonasal outcome test. This is 22 symptoms that are associated with sinusitis. Each one is scored from 0 to 5, so you can get a score of anywhere from 0 to 110. Lower scores suggest better overall quality of life, and if you don't have sinus disease, you probably score somewhere around a 10 or 9. Uh, this is included in your packets, and I would encourage you all to take this test, and if you don't have a primary headache disorder and you score greater than 30, I would get a CAT scan. Studies show that the overall improvement in SNOT score is about 24, and that correlates with about a 50% reduction in total score. The greater the preoperative score, the more likely you are to, to demonstrate benefit. Patients often don't care about a total score. What they care about is individual symptoms. And what we have is we can break these down into five domains. On the left, we have sinus-specific domains, and on the right, we have um, general quality of life measures. So on the left, we break this down into rhinologic symptoms, which include runny nose, sneezing, nasal obstruction, thick nasal drainage, extra rhinologic, which is post-nasal drainage and cough, and ear and facial symptoms, ear consisting of dizziness, fullness, and facial pressure. On the right, we see psychological and sleep dysfunction. Uh, this is important because it, patients can then kind of get education on whether, um, what symptoms they care most about and most likely to improve. What we find is whether patients choose medical therapy or surgical therapy, they significantly improve across all five domains, but the sinus-specific domains improve at a greater rate than the general quality of life improve. Why is this important to you? Well, about a quarter of your patients with chronic sinusitis have a comorbid diagnosis of depression or anxiety disorder. And what we find is that after sinus surgery, the total score for the psychological domain decreases by about 40% in patients with depression. So we have evidence-based medicine showing improvement across multiple areas. We just talked about the quality of life improvement. Smell improves in the majority of patients. Asthma control improves. And by that, patients have less symptoms. They use less medications. And interestingly, patients that do not have asthma are less likely to develop late-onset asthma if they undergo sinus surgery. We also see less systemic medications used for chronic inflammatory sinus disease, and that means less systemic steroids and less antibiotics.
In terms of work, patients are more productive and they're absent from work less often. In terms of long-term studies, the revision rate is about 15 to 20 percent. Uh, long-term means when we measure outcomes at five to 10 years. A corollary to this is that if I have polyps, my polyps will just come back and I'll need surgery again. That's not true. The revision rate for patients with polyps is about 19 percent. However, there are certain types of polyp conditions that have a higher or greater recurrence rate and therefore need surgery more often. This includes allergic fungal sinusitis and aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. So it's important that we take time to figure out what type of polyps these patients have. We use pathology, history results, and CT scans, and then we can counsel them preoperatively accordingly. Also, patients with asthma and polyps have a three times greater risk of needing revision surgery than patients with polyps alone. So this is a list of the failures of surgery. The first was scar tissue, which is seen in this picture. This is a patient's right nasal cavity. The septum is on the right. The middle turbinate is in the middle, and the sinuses should be to the left, but there's scar tissue blocking it, much like my slides. <laughs> so um, I just talked about um, patient disease in terms of the different types of polyps. That affects the outcome. Comorbid diseases like autoimmunity, uh, certain types of autoimmune conditions and cystic fibrosis also lead to higher revision rates. Surgical technique in terms of what's being done and how it's done. And then what's important to you all is patient compliance. It's important that you guys understand what's being asked of patients and then encourage their compliance. After surgery, we use high volume saline irrigations. We also place medicine in these saline irrigations over the long term to help modify the disease and improve outcomes. The media doesn't help in terms of our myths. And in fact, here's an article from 2002 in the New York Times which questioned the results of sinus surgeries. And what it states is that many physicians thought that the new tools would help cure the disease, but now as many of those patients who are returning um, to their doctor's office after the procedure, once again, the early hopes for surgery have been dashed. Well, this is problematic in two ways. First, we're not curing the disease, we're modifying it much like you modify asthma. And second, you have to put this in the context of the time period when this was written. Sinus surgery became popular in the late 80s, so for the next decade, physicians were basically learning on the job about sinus surgery. And what we see is in the last two decades, results have significantly improved. In one study, looking at surgery prior and after to 2008, the revision rate before 2000, I'm sorry, 2008, the revision rate was 23%, after 2008, the revision rate for surgery was 17%. So why is this? Well, there's basically three reasons. Endoscopic techniques have evolved, instrumentation has become more advanced, and adjuvant medical therapy has become more effective. The last reason is probably the most important. Steroid rinses were introduced around 2007 and have dramatically improved surgical outcomes. We talked about drug-eluting stents, both of these decrease patients' exposures to systemic steroids. Most exciting is probably biologics. These are newer medications, and there's currently three that are approved for chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. These are demonstrating some dramatic results in our patients. Currently, it's only for patients with polyps and not patients without polyps. But this is changing rapidly, and I anticipate in the next few years we'll have a lot more of these available. This is probably a, a good place to stop. So in summary, patients have preconceived opinions of sinus surgery that are often false. Multiple surgical options are available to patients. And what a friend or family member has had done doesn't necessarily correlate with what they're having done. Complications are rare but possible with endoscopic sinus surgery. And good preoperative counseling is important. And finally, innovations in nasal packing, surgical technique, and instrumentation have been introduced over the last three decades, leading to easier recovery and improved surgical outcomes. Thank you.